Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Crowdsourcing Sustainability Podcast. Today, we are lucky enough to be with Mitzi Janelle Tan. Mitzi is a climate justice activist and organizer helping to lead the Youth Advocates for Climate Action Philippines, which is the Fridays for Future chapter in the Philippines, as well as Fridays for Future MAPA, which stands for Most Affected Peoples and Areas, Fridays for Future International, and much more. So Mitzi, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you got it. So to start, I'd like to just begin with your climate journey. So when did you start caring about climate and why? And could you walk us through your thought process or any sort of like aha moments that you had along the way? So growing up, I saw the climate impacts firsthand, but I didn't know that they were climate impacts. I saw the typhoons consuming our communities and floods reaching up to second floors of buildings and homes and people stranded on rooftops. And I grew up being afraid of drowning in my own bedroom, but I didn't understand that the climate change, quote unquote, that I was learning in school was the same thing that I was already experiencing because the way they were teaching climate change was very foreign and technical and alienating and would tell us about the melting ice caps and the polar bears, but not about what we are already experiencing. And so it wasn't empowering at all. And it, in points, it was actually factually incorrect because I remember my teacher telling us that smoking was the reason behind climate change, um, which we know isn't true. But because I, have a, I had a lung problem and smoking was actually really bad for me, um, that kind of stuck in my head. And I started to go up to people and talk to people and tell them, hey, you should stop smoking because of the carbon dioxide emissions, the greenhouse gas emissions, global warming, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but as I grew older, because the education wasn't empowering and eventually I realized that smoking wasn't the reason behind the climate crisis, that kind of faded away into the background. Not until 2017 when I was able to talk to a Lumad indigenous leader from our land um, and he was telling us about how they were being harassed and displaced and militarized and killed all for protecting the planet and their home and their forests. And then so simply, he shrugged and chuckled and said, that's why we have no choice but to fight back. And that was really my number one aha moment because I realized that there are people who are so pushed into activism that it is it has worse consequences not to be an activist. And here I was having the privilege to quote unquote, choose to be an activist, having all these experiences and having this knowledge growing up, but not becoming part of the collective struggle. So I realized then that I needed to join that collective struggle for system change, for a better planet and for a better society for our people. Um, and after that, you know, I, actively learned about um, the environmental emergency more. And that's when I stumbled upon the climate crisis, even more like once again, kind of reconnecting to what I knew for, as a kid. And then uh, a few years late, uh, like a year late, that was in 2017. And like a few years later, we started Youth Advocates for Climate Action Philippines. That is awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, so kind of getting back to one of I think the core things there when you spoke to the, uh, what was the name of the the tribe or indigenous peoples? You say Lumad? Lumad. Um, I have seen that the Philippines are one of the deadliest places in the world for environmental defenders. Could you shed a bit more light on what is actually going on there? So in the past eight years, you've been the most dangerous country in Asia for environmental defenders and activists in the past, ever since it, the study started being recorded, I think it's been 12 years now, we've always been in the top five, I think. And it just goes to show that it's wow. because our environmental defenders and activists are on the front lines threatening business as usual. And so they're threatened by paramilitary that are usually connected to the multinational companies that they're going up against. They're threatened by our own military even, um, especially our farmers, our land defenders. There have been um, protests where because there was a drought, the farmers would 
um, would protest and ask for support for rice so that they can plant rice. So they'd ask for rice from the government in the form of support. And instead, they were showered with bullets. And so it came that from there came out the biggest Hindi Bala campaign, which means rice, not bullets. And these are the things that happens in the Philippines, either by paramilitary or by the military themselves, or sometimes it's just activists suddenly disappearing. And then it's gotten worse with with our anti-terror law of 2020. So this is supposedly a law to go against terrorism, but the council that that gets to decide what terrorism means, what the definition of terrorism is, is a council that has historically um, tagged activists as terrorists because these are the people who are going up against the multinational companies, calling out the injustices of the government and the inaction of the government and asking for accountability. And so they think, ah, they're bad people because they're calling us bad. Can you dive in a little bit or elaborate a bit more on what it is that where the conflict is for environmental defenders is it mostly around rainforests and trees and land or like what is the what are currently the big buckets in your mind it's definitely all around so um in the forests um against the mega mining companies there is a lot of resistance especially from indigenous peoples but also local communities then there's also the fisher folk who are fighting against the large scale fishers and against environmentally destructive projects such as large highways, casinos that want to be put up in the coastal areas because we are an island country. Um, it, our fisher folk are also going against um, Chinese vessels because there is a dispute in the West Philippine Sea or the South China Sea. Um, where China is trying to encroach upon our waters and upon our islands in that area. Um, and the large Chinese vessels are actually, bullying is the word I'm thinking of, because it's, in, it's a word in Filipino, but it, to translate, I guess it's bullying, but it doesn't seem as strong. But it's, they're, they're literally like pushing our small fisher folk out of the waters and, and threatening them and, and sometimes making their boats sink. Um, so these are the... That's for the fisher folk and that's for the indigenous peoples. And then you also have your farmers who are, you know, fighting against the monocrop plantations and the, the, the large plots of land that are owned by the landlords. And so they're demanding for their rights there. And that's threatening also to the government because then, you know, they're asking and demanding for genuine land reform to have the land be given to the tillers, to the people who actually farm. But instead, it's being held by like large families and large plots of land, um, and they get all the profit for it. Um, so those are, I would say, all of it, and it, they're all pretty major, and they're all happening all at the same time. Yeah. So it seems like the the common thread is sort of extraction and sort of exploitation, and then the people who are, you know, on the receiving end of this are trying to stand up and and make things a bit better yeah definitely it's not even about for them they don't call themselves environmental activists it's not even about the environment for them it's more about their culture and their lives and their livelihood um there are also a few that that go up against coal-fired power plants because the health of the community is at stake so it's really about it's to them it's more it's not necessarily about the planet, but it's because we're so tied and we're so close to land and the planet, we know that we have to protect it because otherwise we're our lives are at stake. And I think that's really the culture that we have to approach everything because we've been so separated from that notion, thinking that we aren't part of this ecosystem, thinking that we're separate from nature, not realizing how dependent our lives are on nature. You are speaking my language, 100%. Um, you have this quote from, or I'm, I took this quote from an article you wrote because it really stuck out to me. You wrote in the Philippines, activists can get arrested without a warrant, can disappear without a trace and can be killed in broad daylight. What is it like being an activist in this environment? 
it's definitely very scary. I know a lot of people ask me like, oh, how do you stay so brave and how do you stay so fearless? And my thing is I'm not fearless. I'm doing it afraid because I know that we have to. We all have to join this fight. I definitely have this level of privilege because I speak English. I've had the privilege to go, get an education. I live in the city, which means there's more media attention here, sadly, compared to the rural areas. And so we have that cushion of safety with media and things like this. Um, and, you know, it's easier to connect with people. We have ways of communicating with each other much faster. There's internet, everything like that. Um, but still, even with those hardships, it is still very dangerous and it's still very scary. I've had numerous threats online and on social media. A lot of our activists, we, we go through digital and physical security trainings and we are trained to be paralegal so that we know how to be a paralegal in times of, of um, arrests and everything like this. There were times when we had to kind of there were raids in different offices of environmental groups and other activist groups. And so we would come with each other, to each other and help each other kind of guard the offices so that we make sure that it isn't raided because the trend during that time was the police would come, um, show a search warrant, and then plant guns um, or plant bombs and explosives. And it's on video and everything. You see them planting things. Um, and so we would have to come together as as a community, really, even if it wasn't like I wasn't part of that um, um, organization, but we came there and helped support and helped kind of just guard these offices. And it was scary, like having to stay up at night and taking shifts to make sure that no one comes in. And if someone does come in, we have like all these people that we need to call at the same time. And we have people who are supposed to record. And it's just this system and network that. I thought was normal for activists. And then I got to talk to activists from different countries. And it's like, wow, that's not something that you guys ever have to experience and really just grounded me. Yeah. Yeah, that is, that is extreme. <laughs> it definitely takes a, a next level of, of bravery, I would say. So um, just huge thank you and admiration to all of you. Um, what so what happens then sorry i'm just i'm just curious now so like this raid happens they plant all they plant some things what what happens after that to the activists or just what's next in the in the story there so some get arrested um some there so it depends what kind of thing they're approaching if they're looking for individual activists um then the individual activists get arrested if it's the type of where you have to investigate your office then um your organization gets shut down a bit the the your bank accounts get frozen um the people from the office get surveilled and and get checked on um so it's a wide variety of things and they do different tactics and different techniques um and something that was really cool that that some of the organizations started doing then was they started inviting the commission on human rights to their offices to raid but like to inspect the the place already with a video camera on hand with the police so they would do it before the police would try it so then the police they can't the police can't say oh we want to do this because you already did it and you had like witnesses and you had the video cameras and everything so that's kind of how the different groups that were being threatened at that time kind of resolved that um and then we went into the pandemic so that was in 2019 um and then the stories kind of changed after that gotcha Gotcha. Okay, switching gears a bit here. Uh, the Philippines is also one of the most vulnerable places in the world to, to the impacts of climate change. Um, so for people who aren't familiar, what are the big impacts you're facing now? Uh, what do those look like and feel like? I, I know you've experienced some of them. Um, so what is that like today and, and what are the big concerns in your mind going forward? For me, as someone who lives in the city, one of the things that I really feel personally are the typhoons and the floods. That means that I would wake up at the middle of the night and have to scoop out flood water sometimes. And we would spend weeks without electricity because of the raging typhoon outside. 
and I'd have to do my homework by the candlelight. And my story is already such a privileged one. There have been people whose roofs have been blown off. And it's really just, we're seeing how the typhoons are getting stronger and stronger and more and more frequent every year. The three strongest storm landfalls in recorded history all happened in the Philippines just a few weeks ago. Um, this is December 2021. Um, the One of the strongest storms of the year also hit the Philippines. And some of the islands that have never been hit by typhoons of this typhoons really of of this this intensity in living memory at least have been hit and so these islands have no way of 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 un, like bouncing back and being prepared because it used to never happen to these areas um and so that is the thing that really scares me the most frequently i would say but something that creeps up on me a little bit more is the sea level rising, which is a lot slower and you don't see it, but you know it's coming, especially since we are a, an island country and, and Manila, the city where I live in, is a coastal city and the capital city of the Philippines will be underwater in around 50 years um, if business as usual continues. And it's that is so scary to me because it's something that just creeps up on you and next thing you know it's already there if you don't prepare for it if you don't take the climate crisis as an emergency today and the thing is our national government isn't doing anything about the one that already feels like an immediate emergency right like the typhoons we're not adapting to it it's always just band-aid solutions what more this really slow creeping impact that people aren't talking about and seeing because it isn't impacting us right now but we need to prepare for it right now and so those are the things that really scare me and the droughts is something that impacts our farmers a lot and our food security a lot and as i mentioned earlier it it brings a lot of of um um like violence also as the farmers protest demanding for justice and demanding for help asking for help they're usually met with violence and so it's definitely all those aspects rolled into one you got a, a little bit of everything going on do you i mean this is a huge question and people all around the world are trying to figure this out but maybe you've thought about it specifically for Manila and the Philippines. What do you think needs to be done to, you know, protect people and help adapt to what is already locked in? If not, you know, what is worsening with every day we don't eliminate emissions. It's a lot of things. Um, let's start internationally, going nationally. So um, first and foremost, we need drastic carbon dioxide emission cuts from the global north, which has historically caused the climate crisis. So these are countries like the US, um, the EU, um, and also those that are currently emitting the most, which countries like China need to also drastically cut down carbon dioxide emissions. And... At the same time, make sure that the pledges and the promises and the plans to cut down these emissions are measurable in the short term because we have a lot of net zero by 2050 or that means like they won't have as much emissions by this year, but then there are no plans on how to get there. There are no measurable ways to check you know, every year, every two years or every three years that this is happening, that they're on track. Next thing we know, it'll be 2050 and they'll be like, oops, we didn't, we didn't reach the, the target. It's too late to fix anything now. So we need those those short-term milestones. That way we can measure these these promises and these pledges that are that should be put into policy and implemented into policy. And a lot haven't even been implemented into policy already. And then we also need reparations from the global north to the global south. So these are this isn't finance, this isn't aid or support or financial aid. It's really reparations because the global north caused the climate crisis they have this responsibility and this accountability to pay us back for the damage that has happened and this money should be used for adaptation and to minimize and manage loss and damages and when we're talking about adaptation it's so difficult because the philippines 
we have mountains, we have cities, we have rural areas, we have coastal cities. And so adaptation is going to look so different per, per community, right? We have communities that are like in between like valleys and like a floodplain by the river. And we're going to need a lot of research first into what adaptation looks like per community because we don't even have that. We don't even know what kind of adaptation would work, right? Um, some things that we kind of already know is having evacuation centers that are actually built to be evacuation centers because right now we only have gyms and churches and schools. So of course, since they're not built to be evacuation centers, they will also flood when the floods come. And so it's these things that there there's a lack of research even, there's a lack of awareness even in the need for adaptation. And it's always just, ah, there's a typhoon relief operations. And plenty of times the government even fails in that. And it's really civil society and people and organizations coming together to chip in and to have these relief operations and, and help our fellow Filipinos bounce back. But then you can't really truly recover unless you have those adaptation plans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. Uh, I think that's something that everyone is actually way behind on, like even even here in the U.S. Um, and also just to put a stat on something you said for, for more context for folks, uh, the, the, like a country like the Philippines is one of the least responsible for the climate crisis, yet you're facing the impacts first and worst. And the, the stat is that I know the U.S. is responsible for something like 25% of emissions historically. Um, and I personally am of the opinion that, I mean, this is what you're saying, reparations. But if, you call, if you're a quarter responsible for the climate crisis, then you should be dumping a lot of money into helping out uh, the people who are, who are being impacted most by it, as well as... One of the things that worries me most is uh, people who are going to, who are, and will continue to be forced to leave their homes because of extreme weather uh, or a disaster, or you know you can't grow your crops anymore, whatever it is. Um, but being forced to leave, and I think getting back to that, being proportionally a part of the solutions as you are to the problem. Um, now I'm getting into like taking people in, but there will be a lot of people migrating in the future and there's just, there's a lot of stuff to think about all around. Um, yeah, exactly. And, and the term climate refugee isn't even internationally recognized, um, in the UN and everything. And so when people have to migrate or become refugees because of climate impacts, they can't take on that refugee status, although you know, even the refugee status already has its um, failings. But without it, it, it makes it even harder for you to be able to migrate. Yeah. Do you know where that stands at all? Like, are, are they considering changing the status or anything like that? I know there was a breakthrough thing recently where the definition of climate refugees was formalized so we're still at the definition stage um this was my information is coming from a few months back like around september 2020 so might have changed since then but from what i remember the latest thing is just like they have a definition now or like they're almost close to a an actual concrete definition um which i guess means the next step will be like who falls under it, what falls under it exactly, um, and then moving forward to actually putting it in place. Okay, so there is some movement going on in the right direction. I guess that is something. <laughs> um, another thing I wanted to ask you was, you know, the we just said the global north is historically responsible for the great majority of the climate crisis, uh, how can people in the global north be good allies in your in your eyes, in your mind? I first have to approach it from me actually hating the term ally. I don't actually know 
<laughs> okay. Let's, let's I don't dive actually into know what first. good word is, but um, the word ally makes it seem like you're so separate from us, but we're not. We're not. Yeah, exactly. It's more like partners. partners. It's more like there's this beautiful quote, which I will search right now um, so that I don't get it wrong. <laughs> And it goes like this. Hold on. Um, if you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let's work together. So that was by Lita Watson, an indigenous activist. Um, that is beautiful. And and really, that's how I approach the idea of allyship and, and you know, coming in together. It's really less about helping and more about fighting alongside and being in the same fight with us. And I guess that's my answer. Like how, like what can people in the global North do? It's really going out of your immediate bubble and looking towards the people who are most marginalized in your community. So the migrants, the people of color, and then looking globally and seeing, you know, the struggles in the global south that you can support in whatever way, if that's either through amplifying them on social media or connecting with them directly and holding campaigns together. Um, there is this, because a lot of the companies that we're fighting against are being, are in the U S or in, in other countries. So an example is how some of like the, our, our coal-fired power plants, one of their biggest financers is based in the UK, so Standard Chartered Bank. And so we teamed up with, with English um, activists and held a campaign together so that you can um, put pressure there, right on their doorstep and here in the Philippines. And it's these things that we can really work on together, I think is so beautiful and showing that there's real power. I know there's a similar thing happening with um, the East African crude oil pipeline in, in East Africa and Total, which is in France, is is the one that's funding it and pushing for it. Um, and so the French activists are teaming up with the East African activists and it's this you know, beautiful coalition of people working together and fighting for the same thing in these concrete ways. And I know that's difficult for, you know, everyone to take on. It's not like everyone can take on campaigns as easily, but it's really these things, just connecting with other people and learning from each other and establishing that connection um, in whatever means necessary so that we can learn from each other and, and build that alliance um, so that we can work towards a better future together. I love that. And thank you for the, the two awesome examples. That's really exciting to hear. Um, you were just at COP26. Can you tell me what that was like and what your, you know, your big takeaways were or if it changed anything in your mind? Like, why did you go in the first place? Just give me your, give me your debrief after being there. <laughs> I have been asked this so many times and I still have a reflection paper due for for my group um, to be posted on our website. I still haven't gotten around to it because it's so difficult to process. It was so overwhelming in the sense that it was so confusing. It was so exclusive. It was so difficult to find our way and our place and then the results were so underwhelming. And you have this mix of emotions where, you know, you really see that the world leaders and, and the policymakers inside the summit, they're not the ones who will change things because they're still stuck on debating which word is best to use for the text and the final thing. Is it urge or is it decide and you have people outside of the summit having protests every day connecting with each, each other and coming together across cultures and across languages and and i say this a lot where it's literally singing and dancing and and a lot of people are like what do you mean climate justice is about singing and dancing and i'm like literally we are singing and dancing on the streets whenever we protest like in fridays for future there's always so much joy and love and laughter as well as anger and sadness and fear and 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 struggles and disputes and 
there you see people coming together and collaborating and learning from each other and calling each other out and holding each other accountable, even when it's difficult, sticking to each other, especially when it's difficult. And I'm not seeing that at all with the leaders. We're not seeing that collaboration. We're not seeing that coalition that we need to address the climate crisis because it is a global problem. So we need a global solution. But our leaders are just prioritizing the people who have the most profit. You see in there that the fossil fuel lobbyists had a bigger delegation than any single country with almost 500 people. Um, you had the likes of Jeff Bezos and I think Bill Gates walking the, the conference halls with their VIP um, guests and their posses. And they're, they feel more at home in these summits than the people who are actually most impacted by the climate crisis. And that already tells you that there's something inherently wrong with the structures and the systems of COP26. And really, I came in there not expecting that you know, world leaders would solve everything and have climate justice right away. People would ask me, like, what are your hopes for COP26? And I'd tell them, I don't have hopes. I have demands and expectations, right? It's, but I knew, I kind of knew in my heart that, you know, COP26 is a structure that was born out of the system that led us to the climate crisis. And so this same structure isn't going to bring us out of it. What we need is that systemic change. And COP26 is a vehicle to get us towards that and nearer that. And that's why it's still really important that we go and we put pressure and we make sure that people um, tune into it and people understand what it is and why it's so important. But I think that climate justice will only truly be achieved by the people outside and and what happens in COP26, the reforms that happen there are our steps towards that. Yep. Two, uh, two thoughts to build on that. One was just like, that was, you just said the, the fact that stuck out to me almost the most of the whole thing was that the biggest delegation was the fossil fuel industry. They had the most representatives there more than any other country which really tells you everything you need to know. Um, but the other, the other thing you mentioned is how you were making all these connections with people from around the world, especially with other activists and kind of people on the outside of the negotiations to some degree. And that is something that Beth Sawin, who I had on the podcast some months ago, mentioned is what she thought was the most important thing about the COP conferences. Uh, it's all the connections that are made on the outside, all the, the activists and the change makers and people really building some relationships to, you know, make change happen on the periphery and start, start helping each other out over time. So that, that's the kind of stuff that gives me hope out of those things. I also did not have expectations for COP26. Um, but I am really curious, like I've never been to one, so, so I would like to go to one at some point just to witness it, I guess. Um, but yeah, could, could you, there's one other thing that I should have asked you earlier probably, but could you define climate justice in your own words or just like what it means to you? To me, climate justice is recognizing that while we all have a shared responsibility it's common but it's also differentiated so there are people there are countries there are communities that are more responsible for the climate crisis and these same countries communities people are usually least the less vulnerable to the climate crisis and that is because of the systems in place that we have and the climate crisis is really just a, a symptom of the broken system that we have that prioritizes the privileged that prioritizes the richest um and so you see how climate justice is really talking about removing all these systems of oppression and injustice, such as class inequality and sexism and ableism and racism and, and all these isms, because all of these crises, all of these inequalities amplify the climate crisis and are amplified by the climate crisis. It's usually the richest, the, the whitest, the oldest man that is least vulnerable to the climate crisis, but most responsible. Um, and so that's where you see that it's really 
eradicating these systems of oppression and injustice in order to make sure that climate justice is actually achieved because, you know, we could end up with a renewable energy future and system across the world, but the solar farms are displacing farmers and the hydroelectric dams are displacing indigenous peoples and the uh, minerals being used to to create the solar panels are mined by child workers in Africa, which is happening, right? Um, all of the things that I mentioned are happening already with renewable energy. And so it's not just about renewable energy. It's about really making sure that we change the way that we're approaching the energy systems and approaching our economic system so that it's not so extractive because let's say we are in a renewable energy system, if we're still having the same system that we have now that's so focused on profit and overproduction, then you'll end up not having enough minerals for the renewable energy. You'll end up destroying the planet anyway, maybe not through the climate crisis, but through some other planetary emergency. And we have to understand that we have to change the way our system is built not to see development as GDP and the everlasting growth of the global north based on the overexploitation of the global south, but really based on the quality of people's lives and, and the needs of, of people. Because even in countries like the U.S. and in and, and the global north, so many people are also still suffering. And these people are also not the ones responsible for the climate crisis, right? So, yeah. And I'm guessing... For you, you see activism as the best tool to really help make the systemic change happen. Could you talk about the importance of activism a little bit? And maybe, yeah, just like what, what are the key ingredients for a good, impactful, sustained activist organization? And maybe just put a little more color onto what it actually means to be an activist for anyone listening who has never done that before? For me, activism is about going beyond yourself and beyond your immediate bubble and community and joining the collective struggle, which is a big phrase, I guess, and is very vague now that I say it out loud. But it's really about going beyond yourself and beyond your community and connecting with other people and seeing how you can help out. So there are different ways to be an activist. I know that mainstream Western media especially has portrayed activism in a very specific light where it's like the protests and the speeches and the glamorous events and all of this, um, which is very different than how activists are portrayed here in the Philippines, um, which is why it's always such a stark difference where it's like activists on red carpets and then here it's like activists in their red blood, right? Um, um, but really, activism can be anything as long as your intention isn't about yourself and it's about joining that collective struggle. Not even It's not about helping other people either. It's about understanding that as the quote said that our liberations are tied together and to be truly free yourself you also have to help others to be truly free and it's coming together um concretely what does that mean it means looking for other people to to do things with in whatever way that is there are groups that are um that talk to policymakers and they don't necessarily see themselves as activists, but I include them in my activist definition and in my activist bubble. There are people who do things online and on social media where they raise awareness and, and this rise of Instagram infographics. Um, and it actually helps a lot because you, you reach people. And then it's always just so important that you make sure that everything you do is grounded in the people's experience of, of, people who are most marginalized and so it's also going out of these circles and these bubbles and make sure that you listen to the people who are most um, vulnerable and and talk to them and learn from them and then see how you can just keep growing and keep learning and I think that's what activism is really just learning continuously and putting whatever you have learned into action and then getting what you learn from there into your new learning and things like that love it I have a 
I've seen you touch on the importance of love before as well in your writing. Can you talk about that a little bit more and just like where that fits in for you in this, in this work? I think that it is so easy to get burnt out in activism and, and because it is very slow work. It's not fast. It's not immediate. It's not like one protest. You get hundreds of thousands of people in the street even and still nothing changes in the policies, right? It's very slow work. And what you see on media and what you see on social media is just half of the picture. A lot of my time is in meetings and in staring at Excel sheets and, and all the boring stuff. And so it's so easy to get burnt out and to get tired. And for me, I think it's so important that your source is something that won't tire you, something that won't burn you out, something that will fill you up. Um, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be angry and you shouldn't be sad or you shouldn't be afraid or that those val those feelings aren't valid or if you're not coming from a if you're coming from those places you're not a good activist i think that most of the time you're afraid and you're angry and you're sad because of the love that you feel for the planet and for life and for you know majority of the people the people who are most marginalized you know so it's really about that i think it's so important that we come from a place of revolutionary love because that's also how you stick to difficult decisions. That's also how you make sure that when someone is, when, when a co-activist is doing something that is oppressive or you don't like, because it will happen because we're all, you know, in this system and it's ingrained in us, you're able to call them out from a place, not of destructive criticism, but rather, you know, that helping them and calling them out and holding them accountable is something that will better your movement and will better you in the process as well. And so, that activist, knowing that you're coming from a place of love, will also respond to you better. Um, and that doesn't mean that you're not angry when you do it. You are. You can be. But it, it, that that source of love helps you to stick to that, to make sure that it keeps happening. You keep holding them accountable. And you don't just give up on people. You don't just give up on the movement. You don't just give up on anything because it's coming from a place that doesn't tire you out, but rather keeps you going i love that and i feel the same way which is probably why i love that um but i i think it would do us a lot of good if more folks you know climate brings up all these really confusing complex emotions that you mentioned like you can be sad you can be angry um, you can be overwhelmed and i think the more that people are able to kind of take a step back and reflect on what the root of all that is the more they're going to realize it is about love you know love of life love of the place you live love of people uh just everything that we no, really. Um, and I think it's it's really important and I've found to be helpful to be able to tap into that emotion because uh, like you said, that that seems to be the one that is best able to sustain you and is honestly kind of at the root of everything else, which is also good to get to the bottom of. Um, so thank you for putting that so eloquently. Um, I was talking to someone recently. Uh, she's an activist who is more like on the grandparent side of things. Um, what she was asking about how older people should support youth activists. What do you think the best way is for older folks to support the youth in this activism? By not seeing youth activists as different from you and just joining. I think we have to go beyond the idea that it's the older generation versus the younger generation. It's the older generation that caused the climate crisis. It's, it's actually just a very specific set of the older generation. It's not the old working class. It's not the older generation of the farmers or the fisher folk or the indigenous people, or even the older generation of just the normal 
everyday person. It's the billionaires, it's the fossil fuel industry, it's the politicians, it's a very specific set of older generations. And us framing it as if it's the older generation versus the younger generation just alienates like a huge part of the population, which is actually supposedly on our side. And so the best way for the older generation to, you know, help or like support youth activists is to realize that that we are on the same side we're not on separate things again it's almost like the allyship thing it's not on separate things where you have to help it's just we're together i like that reframe (laughs) uh here is a fun one for you do you have any favorite climate chants or signs um Oh no, it's in Swedish. <laughs> Cuz I was I was there recently and my I have amazing friends. And I wish it had an, an English translation that sounded really good, but it's like international solidarity we have one planet, which doesn't sound as great in English, but it rhymes really well in Swedish. Um um wow. Do you know um, how to say it in remember Swedish? It. International solidarity at vi har bara un planet i don't remember the one of the words but it's basically like <laughs> um international solidarity we have one planet and it it it's my climate sign the one that i usually bring says we resist as one planet that's why it really resonated with me and i was like oh my gosh it's my sign um but you can't really chant it in english as well um <laughs> System change, not climate change, is a good one. The one that I learned recently was cool. It's like, one solution, revolution, one solution, revolution, one solution, revolution. That was also really cool. Um, And nothing beats the people united will never be defeated, I think. Especially when it starts getting chanted in different languages. Um, That is so cool. Because like we start with English and then Spanish would come and then English would uh, Filipino would come. And then when we had people from from Indonesia, they would also chant in Indonesian. So it was really cool because like that just feels exactly like what the chant is saying. That's awesome. That's really cool. Um, Along a similar line of thought, do you have any ideas on how to... I've seen you I've seen you write about this. So do you have any ideas on how to communicate better and kind of reach more people instead of, you know, there's a lot of numbers and data and graphs and just like what thoughts do you have on how we could be more effective communicators when it comes to this stuff? I think it's really important that we connect the climate crisis to people. Um, so I love climate scientists. I'm a big fan of them, but often it gets reduced to numbers and statistics and graphs, as you said, and you kind of just clock out when you see that. Like, I, I won't feel anything if I see a bunch of graphs and I'm just like, ah, cool colors, lines. Um, but if I remember that there are people behind that, that this means this, that this is actually already happening and not something that's a problem of the future then you can communicate better. Um, It's always about talking about your feelings also, I would say, because that's something that people resonate with. And and I know it's difficult to be vulnerable, but when you are vulnerable, then people connect with that. And I think it's so important, the power of storytelling and building that kind of picture in people's minds, um, because it is so difficult for someone who has never seen a typhoon to understand what that feels right but but emotions fear sadness anger love these are things that people understand no matter where you're from um and it's also really important to know who your audience is um so back when you know we're in a pandemic now so we don't have schools in person but when we would um do talks in schools i would ask for the age range of the people we were talking to and like adapt my language to what age they were and what memes they were doing in that point of time and and (laughs) it's it's kind of embarrassing because when we were doing like younger people like really young like around eight nine or ten I had to like watch like a bunch of (laughs) um like young video like YouTube videos of really young people to understand like how they would be best communicated to and it's really 
adapting your language and finding what people already understand. So for example, when we're talking to our fisher folk, we don't talk to them about sea level rising as our introduction because they have no idea how that connects to them. So find something that will connect to the person you're talking to and then adjust your language according to that and then dive deeper into everything else eventually. You are good. Uh, I got one more for you on activism and that is just for anyone out there listening who has never been an activist uh, but might like to be soon or is starting to think about it what would you say to anyone who's who's on the fence right now and and might join us i was on the fence for the longest time so imagine i started talking and thinking about climate change at like maybe eight or nine um I didn't realize that I had to be an activist until like 2017 when I was like 19, I don't know, like 10, 11, 12 years later. Um, it's really just about starting and realizing that there is no perfect activist. You don't have to be a certain level of something to be an activist. You don't have to have a certain level of knowledge to be an activist. Everyone starts somewhere and we're always continuously learning we'll never know everything and that's part of being an activist i think understanding that you don't know everything and you'll always be learning and that you'll always be imperfect and that's okay and it's that's not to use it as an excuse to not change but instead when there's criticism you understand that it's a way for you to be better and so it's really scary, I think, to be to start off. And really what pushed me was re be, being able to talk to that Lumad indigenous leader and me realizing that, you know, even having that choice is a privilege. Um, and so we have to use that as a responsibility to, I mean, if you are privileged, you have the responsibility to join and to help. Um, and, you know, it can start small. It can start with you just finding what you like the most. If you like to paint, if you like to talk, if you like to do whatever if you like to sing then you can start there start where you're comfortable and then just you know it'll get scarier but just know that you're not alone like there are literally hundreds of activists in every country across the world fighting for the same thing that you are and I think that's what gives me so much comfort knowing that I don't have to do everything because I'm not alone in this and that's something that's so important to remember because otherwise you'll try to do everything and it's not physically possible it's awesome. And what is next for you? What are you working on now? What are you focused on? What are you excited about? So it's December. And so that means it's resting. <laughs> it's a resting period, um, which I think is so important when you're being an activist. It's so important that you know when to rest and when you know when to say no. And this is something that I'm still actively working on because I'm not great at it either. Um, but I'm really excited for the next year because we're looking at uh, um, deepening our adaptation campaigns here in the Philippines. And we are creating these um, climate modules according to commun that's contextualized per community. So we've started with a small farming community. Um, and so we, we learned from them, we learned about their situation, then we developed a climate module that would help their campaign and that's very contextualized to their experiences. Um, and we're gonna be doing that with a, fishing, a fisher folk community and an urban poor community. Um, and it's a very slow process because it's very contextualized to their experience, but it's so, it just, it, it, it's so heartwarming to be able to learn from people. Um, and that really excites me. And, and I'm excited to connect with more people in the coming year and um, foster more relationships with each other. And, and we're looking to also strengthen our regional groups in Fridays for Future. So in Southeast Asia, we'd ha we've had one for a while, but we're going to try to bring it up more and do campaigns together more as a region, which I think is also really powerful. Um, so those are a few things I'm really excited about. Um, but right now in the short term, I'm really excited to rest and, and get some sleep and watch Netflix movies and, you know, lounge around in my room. And I have this stack of books from when I went to Cop 36 because um, 
it's hard to get like climate books here in the Philippines. They don't usually, they aren't usually sold. So I have to start actually getting rid of some of these because I haven't started at all. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to read some books too. Nice. That actually uh, segues perfectly. I have two more questions for you that I ask everybody. Uh, what book or books do you recommend or gift to people the most? Or this could also be like a video or an article, but like, what do you often give or share with people uh, on climate or just in general? The one, the one that's most recent that I've been telling everyone to read is What White People Can Do Next by Emma Dabiri. Um, and the subtitle is From Allyship to Coalition. Um, so I actually picked up the book because I was telling my friend about how I hated the idea of allyship. And they were like, oh, they said that in this book. And I was like, oh, I have to read it. It's also really pretty. Like the cover has like flowers and everything. And it's it's so great. And it connects to climate a little bit. But it, it has, it's uh, mostly about racism and, and you know, working together and, and systems of oppression and injustice. And she's an amazing writer. Um Another book would be Less is More by Jason Hickel, um, which I haven't actually finished. <laughs> it's one of the books that I got from from Cop 26 and I'm midway. Um, but so far, it's been really good. Um, what else? Um, A Bigger Picture by Vanessa Nakate is new. Um, so I would really recommend uh, checking that out. I haven't actually read it, but Vanessa is an amazing activist and she, I love her. Um, so I would definitely recommend that as well. Very cool. Thank you. And last question here. Do you have any final call to action or message or final just thoughts you'd like to share with anyone listening right now? I would say don't be afraid to start. But if you are afraid, do it afraid anyway. Um, (laughs) I think it's normal to be afraid because the climate crisis is very scary and activism is very scary also in this social media world where it's so easy to be, you know, canceled and called out and everything. But really, it's just about finding what you're passionate about already and then seeing how you can use that and connecting with people. Um, And... I understand that it might be difficult to even connect with people, especially for introverts and people like that. Um, but, you know, there are ways on social media to learn from each other and there are tools online that we can use and we should utilize. And really, it's just that it's it's we're at a time where we need everyone to join. And we need everyone to participate and we need everyone to become leaders. And and that's what we're doing. We're building a movement that is full of leaders that has people across the world that's learning from each other. So just don't be afraid to start. We're not scary. We're not going to bite your head or whatever. (laughs) Just join. That is the perfect way to finish. So Mitzi, thank you again for taking the time and coming on the show and all the important work that you are doing and just really activists around the world. I'm grateful for all (laughs) y'all. Thanks, Ryan. I really love this podcast. I feel like all the things I love talking about the most was squished into one podcast. So that's great. (laughs) Yes. Amazing. Well, we will chat again soon, I'm sure.